Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the CBSPD Hot Topics in the Heat of Summer virtual conference hosted by Beyond Clean and sponsored by 3M. I'm Adam Okada from Beyond Clean, and joining me for this session is my colleague, Hank Balch. So let's welcome in Hank. I would just like to take a moment to thank you all for joining us today. This has been a great day of explosive educational content. We've heard from some dynamic speakers today, and we've saved a great topic for last. I'm excited to welcome to the virtual stage two exceptional industry professionals. Jameed Billingsley is a nationally recognized speaker for sterile processing. He is a subject matter expert in surgical technology and sterile processing and has held positions in the healthcare field as director of surgical services support and surgical services leading petty officer in the U.S. Navy. With over 29 years of experience in surgical services, Jameed is passionate about educating, standardizing, and implementing processes to improve performance in challenging surgical environments. Joining Jameed for this session is Jake McHugh. Jake is an instrument tracking systems coordinator in Jacksonville, Florida. He has over 14 years of experience in the sterile processing field, having made his start as an instrument technician. He's passionate about providing easily accessible and understandable educational opportunities available to sterile processing professionals. Jake currently holds Isham's Gold Crown certification, that's CRCST, CIS, CHL, and CER, and he is the CTO of Sterile Geeks VR. Jake is also a proud member of Beyond Clean's advisory group. As an industry, how do we empower our sterile processing professionals? More often than not, these professionals don't see the real power and influence they have, not only in their department, but as a collective group throughout the healthcare industry. Well, it's time we change that. So let's join Jameed and Jake for this highly anticipated discussion and discover the true value of our industry's frontline technicians. Get ready to feel empowered, clean freaks. Please join me in welcoming Jameed and Jake. How's it going? Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. Our really hey, after gentlemen. Afternoon. Welcome. Get welcome Hi. to the conference. Hi. This has been a crazy, awesome conference so far, and I've got a lot of confidence <laughs> and excitement that we're going to finish strong with this topic, and I really appreciate you all joining us today. Uh, as a reminder to everyone tuning in, this is going to be one of those PowerPoint free sessions. So don't worry about Ooh. having to tune into slides. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're going to keep it nice and fresh here to close it out. And uh, to that point, if you have questions along the way, uh, it doesn't really matter what uh, direction you want to take us. We'll jump in and we'll try to tackle as many of those questions as we get going. I know there's going to be a lot of application questions on this because we're talking about uh, like strategy and philosophy around technicians and empowerment. So if there's any way that we can uh, give you concrete takeaways through your Q and A's, uh, please throw those out there and we'll answer as many of those as we can before we get done. Um, so let's set the stage, right? And I want to, give props uh, where props are due. Jameed, I forget how exactly the conversation uh, came up, but this is your idea, right? Like this conference is kind of built around a phone call that you and I had a um, couple of months ago, maybe now, actually maybe shorter than that, maybe a couple of weeks ago. Um, and you had this kind of thought come to mind that I ran with. And I told you even on that call, I said, we're going to do a conference <laughs> session on this. So give me a little background about how that kind of got prompted for you. So, um, you know, we do a lot of training of managers and uh, frontline leaders and, and like, you know, do this, don't do this, do this. And sometimes, you know, even after we leave, they, they, they're calling us back because they feel alone. And it was really kind of inspired by what Amazon workers did at the beginning of the pandemic. They weren't unionized, but they just went as a group and said, these are the conditions that we won't work on under. And the same thing with the Me Too movement um, with, you know, when an individual feels uncomfortable in a situation, sometimes they hold it in or they talk to it with other individuals. But when they started bringing those up, you started realizing the power of speaking up as a group. So it's not just the manager that can affect change because sometimes, you know, we've been managers, uh, Jake as, as being the IT, um, ITO, uh, I know sometimes you're like, you feel like you're pushing against that wall by yourself and you have a whole team of, of, of teammates and team members that can help you kind of get pushed through that, that wall. So that's kind of mm -hmm. where the conversation came from. Like, how can we 
help um, our team members realize the power that they have. So to kind of set the background here for this technician conversation then, you know, Jake, I'm going to be leaning heavily on you as one of those guys in the industry that I feel like you really got a pulse on the conversations that are happening on the front line. A lot of that's happening uh, through social media, which we'll talk about uh, mm -hmm. here in a moment. But um, give us a snapshot of the, ki the kinds of uh, common complaints that we hear today from technicians in the field. Like, what are the things that you're seeing and hearing that folks are complaining about? Well, I mean, uh, a lot of it usually seems like it's all being piled onto them, um, that they're wanting more from the department, but they keep on getting, you know, they keep on having to give and they're not getting anything in return. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody feels like the understaffed, overworked, underpaid, um, <laughs> so compensation, right? So compensation yes. is a big one. Let's just put that out there, like real front and center, right? We're not getting paid enough, right? Okay. All right, continue. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the understaffed, um, you know, they're, so they're staffing. not seeing. Yeah. 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 So let's flesh that out the, a little bit. Okay. I, uh, th what does that understaffing look like, right? Is that just where you don't have enough staff in general on my shift or not staffing all the shifts? Um, like, how does that play out? Like there, there's more work coming in than they have hands on deck to take care of. So, you know, the decons backing up, there are 10 carts deep all day. The instruments are drying out. They're trying to get turnovers done, but they can't get mm -hmm. the trays for tomorrow ready because, you know, they're still working on today. And case pick is <laughs> pulling left and right, trying to get add ons and changes um, on top of that. And, you know, you feel like one person, even if you get a team behind you, because you're all doing your own thing um, mm. and there's just not enough of you. And it feels like it's growing ever bigger and bigger sometimes. So we've got a third one, right? So we got compensation, mm -hmm. we got staffing and we have the volume or the workflow piece. And, and honestly, like those are three different things. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else? to top that list. And to me, like you can kind of jump in here too, if there's anything that you've heard, you know, directly from these frontline technicians. Uh, Jake, I mean, Jake really covered the, the main ones because even the other ones are kind of connected to that, you know, lack of a mm -hmm. clinical ladder. Um, oh, we don't, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, growth. We, mm -hmm. And so it, it kind of, that goes in it. Uh, when people get multiple, it's like Jake, Jake has the golden crown. I finally achieved whatever the crown after the gold. I don't know what it is, but uh, the uh, so the I get more <laughs> <laughs> I get more certification. Um, but my my organization is like good for you. So those things are kind of tied into compensation. But that's a those are big complaints because it's like they feel like I'm investing in myself and my own uh, my own facility doesn't appreciate me. And, and we as managers, we're like, well, somebody left for a dollar. Well, was it for a dollar or was it because this person was getting a certification and you don't have a defined job description that works with them? Like Jake mm -hmm. is, a, is in charge of the instruments. I would say probably only 20% of hospitals have that position. So right. those mm -hmm. are kind of things that, that kind of marry with the topics that Jake brought up that we get a lot when, we, when we're visiting sites across the United States. Yeah, and it can be also difficult when they're if they do have that position, there's only one person there. Right. Um, so if they never move, what's somebody else going to do? You know, are you just going to be a yeah, tech or if they just got hired. hired? Yeah, like if you just miss that application, right? Like you're the new hire, but they just hired the instrument tracking coordinator, and you're like, oh crap, you know, I'm, I got no hope for like five years, right? right. That could have been me. Yeah. Well. Um, I want to say too, like you brought up to me in another category, like these are all connected, but that recognition piece, that right. is a constant complaint, right? We're not recognized. Yeah. Well, if we are recognized, like people know us, they don't respect us. 
and I won't, it's not like these complaints are just from technicians, like supervisors, managers, director, like I complain about these things, right? <laughs> <laughs> I complain about compensation recognition, staffing volume, the whole thing. Like it's not <laughs> just technicians, but you know, we're going to take the conversation somewhere. So I really want to start with like laying out just those five things that we mentioned and there's definitely more, you know, but those five things are big. That's money, that's staffing, that's volume, that's recognition, that's growth. All of those can can make or break a job, an industry, a career, passion, like everything that we talked about in trying to build up in our technicians. And if they're constantly complaining about those things, that's a signal that there's some brokenness, right? So let's start. Uh, tracking this out, the conversation though, and I'm going to put this question to you first to me kind of for the leadership perspective. So where's the disconnect between technicians and leaders in regards to these complaints? Like when you were complaining, when you're a leader and you're hearing your staff complain about compensation, about growth, about volume, about staffing, like where are the disconnects? Like where's that that breakdown, I guess, happening? That's a good question. And, and the answer is kind of simple, but complex. So the simple answer is the leaders are hearing those, those uh, complaints and they're valid. And you, and, and when I say you, I, I never skipped a step in this industry. So I was a technician, I'm, I'm still a technician. And as a technician, you're like, I'm gonna complain to Hank and he's magically gonna fix it, right? And only if we had that much power because all HR hears is Hank constantly whining about his team being underpaid. And if right. one person leaves, even if you do the exit interview and all that stuff or two people leave, that doesn't have nearly the impact, right? Because if something is going on in SPD, a lot of times it's personal conduct stuff, uh, the team will unite and go to HR about like there's a supervisor that's a jerk or whatever that that is. They'll all march down to HR for that, and rightfully so. But also, have you ever thought about marching down to HR for the compensation issues, for the clinical ladder issues? Because uh, right now, they're just hearing from Hank. They're just hearing from Jake. They're just hearing from Jimmy. So that's one person out of 5,000 employees. Whereas if you have 30 employees and a conservative number, 11 of them went down there and said, hey, I'm not saying I'm leaving. I'm just saying our compensation is not on par with the other hospitals around. Which right. one is going to drive an immediate market evaluation? Me, just one person or a group and myself kind of advocating for that? So maybe to, to restate that, like the first disconnect is this assumption that a manager or director can do whatever they want to do right, in terms right. of, you know, fixing a problem. So if, if you're not getting a compensation increase, you're not getting a career ladder. If you're not getting more staff, it's because my manager or my director doesn't want to do it. Right, so let's right. just dispel that myth. Yeah, we, right. We, we, yeah. That, that myth can be it, yeah so that may it. be true, but it doesn't have to be true. Right. And oftentimes right. to your point, it's usually, it's more common that the manager is trying to advocate and is trying to, to make those fixes, but for whatever reason, and there can be a lot of different reasons, they're just one person to your point. And that's a very important point. It, it's one body, it's one name, it's one knock on the door, it's one email uh, to try to make this change. And the potential out there that we're gonna talk about for the rest of this session is what would happen if it's not just one? Right. if it's all these technicians. Right. So to put it back to you, Jake, from the other side and to the perspective, like where do you see that disconnect with the, uh, the frustrations on the front line and that kind of management, like leadership perspective? Like what do you think is the breakdown between those two? Well, I think in... Uh... One of the problems is that a lot of frontline technicians, when we're on the floor, we see, you know, the manager is in their office They're They may be coming out time, but, you know, the decisions are made behind the, the curtain and mm -hmm. they're not a part of the process. 
And, you know, Jameed talked about, you know, going as a group and going to HR. What if, you know, the manager bringing technicians to these discussions so they can see what the manager is going up against potentially, like that he is asking and what the reasons are, but that certain things aren't moving forward. And the technicians might have answers on or different processes on how to possibly make things work or other ideas instead of one person just going up and saying, well, we want more money because, and they could work right. together with the manager and HR and maybe get somewhere, but getting that visualization. Yeah. So, that's a piece. Of, yeah, so that I'm piece sorry? about uh, it, to maybe state that a different way, like you're seeing that you don't see a lot of leaders pulling the staff in and actually leading in that direction. They're trying, they're trying to go it alone, like the Lone Ranger, to make the fixes, and then it's not working, and then staff is getting frustrated because they don't see another outlet for change, but they're not necessarily being invited in to those conversations. Is that right? Yeah, and you know that when the technician asks the manager, "Hey, can I have?" can I get more compensation? And the manager, you know, disappears, comes back and says, you know, they said no. Right. To be a part of that conversation, I think, <laughs> would give the technicians a bigger appreciation to say, no, he actually did ask. And that mm -hmm. would get people to get together and say, well, how can we try to make this work? Hmm. So uh, the piece here, like there's obviously disconnects, right? And we've seen like mm -hmm. just two examples of those, you know, from leadership side and from the, the frontline technician staffing side. And I agree with both of them. Like, I honestly think that uh, that they're good examples um, of some of those kinds of tough reasons for the breakdown. And we have to admit, I think everybody on this panel will agree, uh, uh, there is such a thing as a bad leader. Uh, and we do have bad leaders that are just not doing a good job in general of advocating for their staff. Or uh, to your point, Jake, a, a, a leader that's disengaged and not inviting in that, that frontline engagement and, and feedback, you know, like there's some leadership issues there, even outside of the empowerment conversations, you know, that we're talking about. Um, at the same time, and this is something that, you know, I think, Jimmy, like you brought up uh, prior to the beginning of this session and even on our first phone call, uh, there's also a misconception on the part of technicians for what their role is in change. Right. Um, right. And I'm wondering if you can kind of lay out that and maybe like a bust that mental uh, uh, myth, right, as some of these technicians uh, – who are tuning into this session, like maybe sitting there thinking about themselves or their opportunity to affect change. Uh, I can, and that, that's a great, great point. So who's going to more likely have solutions in a department than the frontline technicians? Nobody. And so a lot of times good ideas either are talked about in the, in the, uh, the cafeteria, the break room or on the floor and they're not presented. And, and I never feel like the, the uh, frontline technicians have to come up with a business plan or write the whole thing out, but it's just uh, how often are you having those critical and crucial conversations with your manager? Because to your point, not every manager is, is, a, is a quote unquote born leader because I, I don't believe in born leaders. Mm -hmm. I think that leadership is a, is a skill that has to be worked at. Um, but what you have is there's more technicians that are involved. There's more technicians that got the seven CUs from this, this uh, event than managers. I guarantee you're right. that. Yeah, and I know you're right. What I find is a lot of times technicians are interested in frontline technology um, process improvement. They just don't call it that, you know, they, they mm -hmm. may call it something else. Oh, why don't we have this product or the other place where I work my second job? which is an unfortunate part of, of, of being a technician in our industry, has this. And what that is is process improvement. I know this works. And so a part of that being that change is not leaving it to just your manager. The average, Like Warren Niss says, the average tenure of the manager is about five years. 
Um, and But when you look in the department, you have several frontline technicians that have been there longer than five years. So they're holding a bunch of knowledge and, and, and kind of share that knowledge and bring it up. And, and then don't be afraid to bring it up to your manager's boss as well, right? And so if you can convince one of your partners, like if you think something is a good idea, and Hank thinks something is a good idea, and Jake thinks something is a good idea, even advocate in that way. If three of us came to, and you, you know you've been in the office, the same thing you, Jake, when you're ordering instruments, if three different techs came to you and said, hey, we should streamline this tray this way, that is going to have such a huge effect on that change. So it's not just these big issues, it's the everyday issues. You know, Jake talked about not enough people. Um, so it's one thing we don't have enough people, but sometimes you see you don't have enough people assigned correctly, right? Mm. So you've got a bunch of people in assembly waiting for trays to come out and one person in decon. So I mean, let's just be real. It's we got too many people on first shift. That's the problem. <laughs> Everyone understands. <laughs> not enough people in second, not enough people in third. They're all that's first. around the country. And and the, the big thing that I always say is whether it's a union shop or it's not a union shop, is is if everybody on second shift went to that manager's office and said, We've got to have more people on second shift, uh, you know, the excuse is always, well, it's trays left over. Of course, there's trays left over when you have 14 people on days and six people on nights. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. just, so part, that's part of it, just advocating. And again, I'm not saying form a union, but it's, take some of those conversations that are happening out on the floor. Uh, maybe take some of the, 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 the colorful language out of them, but bring them to your, <laughs> your manager, bring them to your leader, bring them to your instrument coordinator, bring them to your team lead. And that, you can drive that change because I promise you, you could ignore something from that one tech that's always going to Isham and always going to CBS, BD chapters and always bringing back those ideas. But when it, when it starts adding up, you're going to have to look at what it is, even if you're not the best of managers. So that's one of the things is you guys can get together and drive change because right is right. I like that sharing ideas um, and not just really trying to carry it yourself. A lot of times we, our input is based on the manager's reaction. That should not have any, your input should be based on your input. Like if you have ideas, don't go, well, I asked him about this last year and he didn't do it. Uh, so maybe he did act on it and got denied, or maybe she didn't act on it and didn't get the, whatever it is, the easiest you can make it is not to bring up those ideas. So right. the, to advocate for your department, because that's, that's really the thing. Hank, when you were talking, Hank, and I thought about something. Sometimes managers can't address those issues of compensation, uh, uh, staffing, and all that stuff, because frankly, and, I, and I'm, I'm speaking personally, um, sometimes we're thinking about saving our jobs. And I'm here to tell you, the best way you can save your job is to get in there and listen to your technicians and get make sure that they are living in a happy environment because those are the, it's nothing you can do by yourself to save your job you need the rest of those technicians so if you're a manager listening or if you're a tech that feels like your manager is not engaged well guess what i'm, I'm going to tell you stop letting your manager not be engaged think about right. that are you letting your manager not be engaged you brought up two things to me that i want I want to highlight for the audience too. One of them is that tenure that, uh, like you can call it institutional knowledge, right? If you add up all of the years of experience at the facility, at the technician level, and compare that to your manager, even if your manager has been there for 40 years, right? All those technician years of experience in that facility is going to far out scale and outweigh that that number and, and there's a lot of power there it's it's the knowledge of the workflows and the challenges and the cultures of all these other departments uh, to the physicians and the OR staff it's all of that is present in our frontline technicians uh, if they view themselves and start viewing themselves as a group and that's the other point that you brought up. You're not necessarily advocating like for or against the union environment, right? You're just advocating for 
that collaborative uh, self-assessment that we don't have to be frustrated or complain as individuals. We can be frustrated and complain as a group. Uh, and that's much more likely to affect change, right? It is. It is. Oh, so to get some practical stuff here, Jake, um, this session obviously is about the real power to frontline technicians. And I really want to dive in to this question about empowering our techs. Like, what do we need to do uh, as this panel, as industry leaders, as thought leaders, as coworkers, as department leaders? Like, what do we need to do and can we start doing today to empower our technicians and let them see the real power that they already have? I mean, uh, technicians need to start, you know, and they already do. We need to ask questions more and make our voice heard, start questioning what we're doing and going out and research to make sure that it is, you know, the best practice or is there a better practice that we can be doing? And then bringing that up the chain to the manager um, and to infection control, to risk management, if there's really, you know, a good idea in there, share share that information with anybody who will listen. Um, I would suggest also, you know, you had said calling other hospitals in your area, find out what everybody else is doing, because somebody has a better mousetrap out there. And if they've already done all the research, um, it's less work for you. So... Mm reach out and find somebody that wants to work with you to make your department better and right. get the manager involved, make the manager get himself involved. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and again, like going back to the whole strategy here, uh, and I think that you brought this up to me that if you're that one person already that, you know, Jake is describing the person who loves best practices, who's going to conferences, who is consuming this content. It's not going to be enough. Like, just like the manager can't do it by themselves. Like you can't do it by yourself as the one tech who is excited and cares about all this. You've got to uh, engage that conversation with your coworkers who may not quite be as excited about listening to podcasts as you are right? <laughs> or going to webinars on Friday. Right. So like, how does that conversation, how do you spark that inside your coworkers? Uh, if yeah, you're not their manager or their boss, like you're just someone who's in the same department as them, but how do you get this conversation going to build that true collaborative spirit? So, I mean, it's really, it's doing it yourself to prove like the idea and asking them to join in. They may not pick it up at first, but after watching you do it, if it really is a better process and you teaching them what, what it is, they start to pick it up and it doesn't happen overnight. It happens with repetition and, you know, steering the course being that, you know, the statue in the department, you're going to keep doing it, this, this process until you learn a better process. And then you grow and change and people start to go, yeah, he's, they've got it. They, they know the, the, what to do. And you start mm -hmm. gathering more and more people involved. Yeah. And I, I'll just add to that, to view yourself as, um, kind of an evangelist, right? Like you've got the good news of the best practice. All right. I, I was, I, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, yeah. I won't steal your thunder. Go ahead. No, no. Well, I know your background, but um, probably the, the, the most spiritual guy that I ever had a chance to work with, and I, I hope he's looking here somewhere, Henry Harrington. Um, and so I work with a lot of people who try to be evangelists and they're telling you all about it, but you see what they do and it just doesn't match, you know, mm -hmm. and he didn't try to preach you or corner you. He just did it. He just lived it. And so as, as Jake was speaking, I was thinking about that stuff. Whenever I'm, I'm speaking in different parts of the country, I, I love doing that. And I always ask a question that makes everybody think in the crowd. 
How many of your coworkers and the OR know that you're here now on Sunday, on Saturday? And, and the hands are not 100%. And that's part of it, the PR. It's like, hey, guys, you know, you're at huddle. Anybody have anything? We got the turnovers. We know what's going on. We know what the assignments are. Anybody have anything? Don't forget next weekend, there's a there. Don't forget there's seven CEUs with with Beyond Clean. Don't forget next weekend we have a chapter meeting, and so you just say that, but you have to live up to it, right? You you can't come back. You can't go to all that stuff and come back and be a mediocre uh, uh, team member. But as you start coming back, they start going. I want whatever Jake has because he comes back. He's always thinking. He's always knowledgeable. He's always thinking about a different way to do it. And then next thing you know, you'll have a little cult following. And then right. what, I, what I call it, making it cool to do things right. And so if you can change the culture that the nerdy people about SPD, and for God's sake, when your family is on the table, you hope you got a nerd rather than the cool laid back person who's not on a, on a podcast at 430 uh, on Friday. <laughs> That's who you want to do your trade. And so you just have to make it, uh, I'm dating myself, Huey, Huey uh, Lewis and the News made a song called Hip to Be Square. Make it hip to be square about um, SPD. And so, yeah, Jake, you, you are on the right path. You just got to come back evangelizing. Man, it's great. It was a great presentation, man. That was great. Did you know they have a, a, a biological that reads in 24 minutes? had an account last year that was still doing three-hour biologicals. And it was like, that was driving their IUSS rate. Right. So, because uh, vendors were like, well, I can't wait six whole hours for the whole process. So we could just, if we just flash it, at least I could get it back in an hour. And so I was like, you, you guys don't know about the 24-minute biologicals? They, they'd never heard of it. And I was like, they don't have a Jake. They don't have a Hank. They don't have a person that's fired up because at least you can bring that stuff to their attention. And, and, and again, you, you just have to come out, live it, and, and evangelize. You can drive change. You know what's yeah. right. You know what's wrong. That's great. Um, yeah. Let's jump into a couple of the questions here. I, I forgot to be looking at this as we got <laughs> going. We just got into it too bad. So, uh -huh. so let me pause here and uh, get some of these questions. So if you've been holding off on your question, go ahead and give that to us now. And we'll try to Bring tackle a couple on. of these. Bring them on. So, uh, yeah, the first one here from Susie says, what should we do to get the recognition that we deserve? Uh, because we should be as appreciated as a surgical tech because we learn all the instruments in the facility and not just one specialty. So I'll start with you, Jameed, because, you know, that kind of it's close to home, right? So, like, how do we balance that? Because that's a common uh, complaint or question is we're not even as, like, respected as these surgical techs who they focus like sometimes just on orthopedics or just on neuro, you know, but then SPD's down here and we got to know it all, right? So, like, where do we start with that conversation? There, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, as a surgical tech, we, we did at one time have to learn all the instruments. Right. Um, but <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> don't, don't think of it as you versus the surgical techs. What Great. you can do is, like, how, what when you think about surgical techs and recognition, what are they getting that you, you don't get? And that's where that two-way accountability comes in. Uh, hey, who did you nominate for employee of the quarter? Who, did you nominate somebody for employee of the month? Hey, did you nominate somebody? And so as they, oh, the first time they're going to say, I never thought, of, if they're a good manager, they're going to honestly say, I, I didn't even think of that. If they're not a good manager, they're going to like, yeah, nobody got it. <laughs> After a couple months, you can ask HR. Are we getting people not am I was I nominated? Are are we nominating anybody for uh uh employee of Good the month? Question. So really has that's a, a fair question. I always believe people who work with me, they know I believe in two way accountability. You can ask me something and if I give you an answer, you can don't feel like you gotta wait a year for the answer. If I said I'll have it done by Friday, Thursday afternoon, you can say, Hey, remember you said you're gonna have that done on Friday. If I said I had it done on Friday and then you don't ask me to 2023, <laughs> I, I need you to own a little bit of that. So 
don't be afraid to do that two-way accountability. Are we nominating people for employee of the month? How, when we talk about a clinical ladder, one of the biggest things is um, is funding. Sterile process technicians uh, have this way of knowing the pay of everybody around the hospital. <laughs> it's like I, a magic skill, right? It's like a magic <laughs> skill. And so yeah. if, if you're talking about compensation or you're talking about uh, recognition or you're talking about clinical ladders, the one of the best things you can do, and Jake kind of said this, is, well, x-ray techs have a x-ray tech one, two, three, and four. Okay, if you're the manager, how did you get the x-ray tech one, two, or three, and four? And it, well, it was like that when I got it. Well, can I see the job description for x-ray tech one, two, three, and four so that I can kind of mimic that? So that's right. kind of the way, but you as a technician, because that's who we're talking to, you can drive that boat. Because if you, right. you know stuff, a lot of times, again, th this myth that your manager or director knows everything, we don't. We don't. We barely know all the job descriptions in our department. So when you start saying, hey, you, did you know L&D has a L&D Tech 1, 2, and 3? That's great for your cause, actually. Because you can come and say, hey, why does L&D Tech, you know, as, a, as the manager? So don't be afraid to share some of that knowledge um, and, and kind of hold your, your boss uh, 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 if you will, accountable. But I, I will ask you one thing. Hold your fellow technicians accountable as well. If you want your boss to be engaged and you want your boss to have time to engage in that, you, you can't go like, well, I'm doing 20 trays and Hank is doing four trays and talking on his phone the whole time. <laughs> so it, it's got to be a little bit yeah. of that as well. So I was just uh, this afternoon, I was looking through some of the old, uh, like the old articles I wrote. And there was one that I, uh, I titled, you are your brother's keeper. And <laughs> it, uh, th th that's what it was all about is in sterile processing, we cannot afford to be lone rangers and to be minding our own business. You know, the whole yeah. thing was no, everybody has to be minding everybody's business in our department because it, it is a team effort and you've got to double check and triple check each other. If it's a process, mm -hmm. workflow, compliance, documentation, we've got to have each other's backs. And that means um, being all up in each other's business in terms of the workflow, yeah, <laughs> right? right? You can take that too far, but um, that's an important point. I really I appreciate you bringing that out too with the recognition piece and that comparative piece to the other departments. And just to bring the theme back again, um, the power there is if you're a technician that gets that information like, oh, the x-ray techs have this career ladder, don't just take it to your manager and then leave it on your manager's desk. The whole purpose of this session is get your other technicians aware of that career ladder, get them riled up and excited about <laughs> that. Like, not like in a bad way, like pitchforks and fire, you know, but like get them riled up that, listen, guys, this is happening in another department and we can make it happen here, but we got to stick together. We got to have this conversation as a team. So that's a great point. Um, I got one for you, Jay, that I want uh, I mean, Jake, that I want you to get started. <laughs> this is a fun one. Um, Actually, do can, manage I, can I speak to that last yeah, question? No, go as ahead, well? yeah. yeah. Jump in, jump in. So, you know, the question originally was like, why is sterile processing not as appreciated as say the scrub techs or the x-ray techs? And a lot of times it's because they're, they're face to face. They're in the rooms with them where, you know, it's always, it's just SP known entity that just makes mistakes. So, you know, I suggest, and I do this regularly, try and get out of your department once in a while, even if it's like a, a, right before your shift or right after your shift, get in the OR and, you know, make yourself the face of uh, sterile processing. Ask people idea. around, like, is everything idea. going okay? What are your challenges? You know, has there any, been any issues today? So that you can not only show yourself and be like, hey, I care. You can bring that information down that they give you and, you know, share it with your other technicians share it with your lead share it with your manager you know hey did you know gyn had issues with their needle holders today mm -hmm. that, that's great that is a great yeah. idea yeah so i don't All think it's uh, the same high <laughs> sorry i don't think my idea is going to get any traction but 
I've uh, talked about a couple of times the idea of putting cameras in sterile processing and like a live feed the way that you would uh, like see like there's some restaurants, you know, that have a camera. So like you can watch them making the food in the bank, like, you know, doing the pizza and stuff. And uh, to get to that point, Jake, that you're saying people don't know what we do. They don't know how hard it is. They don't know how important it is. And we can only take so many people back behind the red line and actually show them. But mm -hmm. if we had cameras, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time making a case on this <laughs> on this session, but if we had cameras that we could live feed out to the hallway where anybody walking by could see all the complexity, inspection, oh and the testing, God. all that going on, Brilliant it would be idea. huge. Uh, so anyways, moving on. So, Jake, here's a hot potato for you. Um, okay. And let me see. This is from Gene. I'm going to oh, no. give you a shout out here, Gene. So uh, do managers or should managers get in to decontam on the dirty side and assemble a few trays, even picking cases when when the department is busy once in a while? What's your perspective on that? You know, I think they absolutely should. The manager, the more hands on they are, the more they're going to know the, the problems that are going on. Uh, you know, the technician can complain about the, the sink not being able to go up and down. It's broken in the down position. Everybody's breaking their backs. But unless the manager is going in there, you know, maybe nobody said anything. They're, they're washing a tray and, hey, this sink isn't moving. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> been like that for three months. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, you know, they see how the case carts are coming in not pre-cleaned or the case carts are coming in and trays are all mixed together. Um, and, you know, it's helping them out. It's helping us when we're in the department doing whatever we're doing. It's helping us out and we get to see that. Um, so I had our surgical services director came into decontam, PP'd up to the head to toe and was mm -hmm. dumping trays out with the rest of us. So that was really nice. cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, what about you, Jimmy? Do you have any other insight on that and the impact in particular that that kind of leadership presence on the floor has for this uh, conversation around it, empowering technicians? What, what I can say is managers, don't fool yourself that rounding is the same thing as working. Like, okay. Because you know, oh, a lot of times we do because we have a lot of stuff to do, right? And we're like, oh, I'm, I did rounds and everything okay, Hank? Yeah, it's good. And and, and like Jake said, you know, I, I'm, I'm helping out. I'm trying to catch up on this mountain of pill packs. And I'm like, hey, what's going on with the, what, what's going on with this heat sealer? It, it's terrible. It's like, that thing's been broke for three months. Oh, that means three months I wasn't doing enough work in rounding. Because every time I came over here and said, is everything good? <laughs> yeah, that's good. But, but right. so you, whether it's the heat sealer pack, whether it's the, the sink, rounding is not the same as working rounding. And if you're mm -hmm. a manager and you're like, how do I fit that into my schedule? Just do lunch reliefs. Just do, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to do uh, Monday, I'm going to relieve in decon. Tuesday, I'm going to relieve on the sterilizer. Wednesday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do relief on case cart. And just doing those lunch reliefs, because, you know, people can be formal when you're like, hey, how's everything going? But during lunch release, people are, they want to get to lunch. So they're like, all right, we need these cases pulled. We need this. All right, see you later. And so then you get a real view of how your department is operating. What are some challenges that they're facing? And sometimes some of the ugly things that may come down when you're not on the floor from your, your customer department. So hmm. rounding is good. I'm not saying stop rounding, but working rounds is different than rounding. Because people are going to say right. whatever to, to get you out of their face, which is different than what's the real problems. Yeah. So we've got a, another question here from Maja. And uh, I'm going to ask this question to myself first. Uh, so I get the first answer. And then if you want any, if you want to jump in and add something, you can. Uh, the question is, what suggestions do you have for smaller offices where the department only consists of two to three staff and a manager? And it's so funny. Like The reason I want to answer this first is I was just thinking about this this morning for like some random, I don't know what prompted it, but it was 
it was a conversation around a career ladders, right? So like tech one, tech two, tech three, like that's only applicable for these departments that have a large enough staff to have a ladder to work like from, right? So what's the answer and what's the solution for these smaller departments? Well, uh, part of my answer is in some sense, it's almost easier for you uh, to get alignment at that frontline level, because you just got two, three people that you need to get on the same page, right? It's not 30 people to all uh, agree that this one process or this one change needs to happen. Like you got your two friends that you see every single day and you're all, always working together. So you just say, hey, we should probably be paid more, right? Or hey, like we should probably be able to leave at nine o'clock if we get all the cases ready for tomorrow like why are we having to stay till 10 o'clock every night right, right. let's have that conversation with the manager and so mm -hmm. the career ladder piece you know it's still interesting for these smaller facilities because there's a trade-off right you may not have the ability to career ladder in sterile processing but a lot of times you get more access uh, to those other departments through that smaller facility culture and communication. And you hear about opportunities uh, to transition out of sterile processing even, and you would in these larger facilities where it's just hard to interface with True. the people in supply chain or with the people in radiology or, or whatever else it is. And so there's perks, right, that happen on the smaller field that don't happen in the bigger industry. Um, but I think it's important, like, I don't know all the answers to how do we keep these smaller facilities going, but it's an important thing to talk about because we can't just have solutions that only work for the big boys, but then all these little ones are like, well, yeah, what about us? Smaller departments are departments too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, small but mighty, right? <laughs> um, all right, so we're... It's about 46 minutes in, and I want to make sure to flesh out some concrete examples of this. And I actually wrote an article after Jameed and I talked the first time to flesh this out. And in that article, we kind of talked about this before. We brought it up a little bit on the topic of social media. Uh, today, what I see in the industry, when technicians get frustrated with their leaders or with their departments, the first thing they do, they don't do what Jameed said typically, which is, hey, like get some collaborative conversations going with your team members, like get a group and go to HR or even bring it to the manager. Like we just spent a couple of minutes you know, talking about all the things a manager can find if they start working in a department, like no one told them that the heat cellar was broken or that the sink was broken, right? Like you just find all these things because technicians are not communicating. But I bet you Facebook knew the day uh -huh. that heat sealer broke, yeah, right? It. Like My 350 blessing. people. Right. <laughs> yeah, they all knew. They said, oh, man, like man, Johnny heat sealer's terrible. down. <laughs> they don't even have a heat sealer broke, broke again. again. Yeah, well, then, like, Jake makes a meme about it and gets, like, a thousand likes, right? So, like, it just <laughs> snowballs from there. But Everybody knows that the high manager. <laughs> yes, that highlights a huge hole. And, again, one of the cores of this session is I'm going to argue here today, right now, that we waste a lot of passion and focus and opportunity through social media. Now, don't get me wrong. I love social. I probably love social media more than anyone in this whole friggin' industry, right? I am all about it. <laughs> However, it if used improperly, it can waste your time and waste your passion, and you will never see the concrete changes in your own facility that you want. Like 300 likes on a complaining Facebook post will not fix your heat sealer. One conversation... <laughs> To your clinical manager or to your clinical engineering team or biomedical team could fix it right so that's the breakdown uh, guys talk amongst yourself <laughs> what do you have to say about that <laughs> well i mean I, I completely agree go ahead, go ahead, you gotta to um, so like you you brought up the memes i print those out and post them sometimes so you know 
somebody's dragging trays out without a dust cover of them on them or in a closed case cart we we got one up that has gandalf that says you will not pass unless you're in a closed <laughs> case cart or nice. or got a dust cover on it you you have to make that knowledge available in your department because in your department's the only place it's going to do anything I mean, Jake, you're, you hit it right on the head. And, and why don't we do this? How about this? I know some of us are addicted to social media. In fact, um, we had an employee that was about to be terminated because she just couldn't stay off of Candy Crush even between cases. Like, she was a, a, a first assistant, and she just couldn't stay off it. So I know this addiction. So I'm not going to tell you to stop uh, posting on social media. But what I am going to ask is, would it be possible to also inform your your leadership team, Biomed? Um, believe it or not, you can actually call facilities. They don't have a manager-only policy. So those are some of those things that, that you can do to affect change to go along with your social media posting. But if you're not telling your facility and you're not giving them the opportunity to fix it and you're only using social media, then... It, the question kind of say, it, the question is, are you an agent of change or are you an agent of complaint? So I, I think there's a place for both of them, but that, that's just my opinion. I see the questions yeah, rolling. Yeah, no, that's in, great. So I want to, I want to, want to address some of those because those are some good questions rolling in. Yeah, 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 I saw those too. Um, yeah, I'll just add real quick before we jump in to some of the questions that. Uh, that piece about being an agent of change is important and your point about it's not either or right because there is there is value even in knowing that you're not alone in right. those facebook groups especially like to realize hey i'm not the only one who when my cart washer goes out it's like the end of the world you know I like it, cart washers go out. My, oh i know we fill it in our soul and in back. our backs right? yeah. like it is an impact and mm -hmm. to just be reminded that everyone else in the industry knows that and feels that you're not alone. Like there's moral support there. Right. So I don't want to undercut that. And I think you did a good job. You know, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying, Hey, like, don't talk about these things. Um, but we are saying it, it, don't talk about these things and complain about these things. If you're not also going to do something at home uh, to get that, that change started in your facility. Okay. Let's jump into to some of these questions, um, this is a leadership ex, uh, question, so I'll throw this one over to you, Jameed, first. Uh, have you ever experienced your leadership team not wanting you as a leader to do manual labor in a particular area because th they feel like you've got more important things to do as a manager or as a director, right, than working in the department like how would you handle that conversation oh hey first of all shout out to the question ask, uh, uh, ask her one of my dear friends um that sounds like a union shop and that's always it's always tricky um when your team feels like what you think of as help is taking opportunities for them but it's really kind of having that conversation and saying hey I can't let you fall behind just to prove that I don't have anything better to do. I don't have anything better than not letting you fall behind. So I'm not going to get in there when you guys have it going, but if it's 10 carts back in decon, or if we have a bunch of sterilizer loads that need unloading or whatever that is, as the manager of this department, and, and I know the, there's the union rules differ other places and, and sometimes the culture differs. Uh, there's, I can't think of anything bad about getting in to help your team get to where they need to get. So um, that's how I would ha handle it. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, we got another hot topic one, so we can't spend a lot of time on this, but we actually did a full uh, LinkedIn Live interview on this topic. And Jake, you might have even been on this panel about cell phones. I don't remember if you were on that one that we did or not. But, I don't think um, I was. Yeah, so the question is, what about cell phones being used in departments? And uh, this is probably coming with your Candy Crush comment to me earlier. <laughs> um, 
and yeah, like, like, you know, this is a hot topic. And again, it's really one that uh, I think deserves more time than we're going to be able to give it. But Jake, do you want to take a stab at this? Like, what's your opinion on that? I mean, phones definitely shouldn't be out. We shouldn't be playing Candy Crush and uh, watching Netflix while we're working, even though, you know, you're trying to pass the time uh, doing the same tray over and over. But I mean, I think it is important to have it possible on you. If there's an emergency call, you know, your kid's getting sick at daycare or, you know, the house is on fire, <laughs> God forbid, but <laughs> right. you've you got to be able to be got a hold of. But I would just keep it in my pocket, not having it out on the floor as a distraction. And, you know, you don't want wherever your phone has been to get on your instruments and you don't want your instruments to get on your phone. Right. We're going to do a session on cell phones. I've decided right now. So just stay tuned for a future you, you conference know, event. <laughs> it is one of the hottest things. Um, it is. I, I, would, I would just say um, I love what Jake said. And I know some managers are – are um, very, very strong about not wanting cell phones past the red line. And that's easy to say when you have your ASCOM phone and your family has your desk number and all that stuff. I would, I would just say, um, is it because you don't want to enforce the rules or because, so it depends on your hospital policy, but Jake kind of pointed out, we don't have a number that they can call us at when we're on the front line. So if right. somebody, if they can maturely handle having their cell phones and they don't have them out, I don't have a problem with them. And I know I'm in the vast minority of people in my <laughs> age group uh, from that, but um, I, I don't have a problem enforcing it. So um, okay. I, that's how I feel about the cell phones. I know that there's a need to um, make sure that assurance that your family can get in contact with you. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm with yeah, well. It goes back and this is a good like transition and I'm going to give each of y'all kind of one last opportunity to make your case for technician empowerment, you know, but I want to tag on to what you just said, Jameed. It's about being professionals and right. viewing yourself and, and acting as a professional. Like you want respect while well, act in a way that demands respect. And part of that is how you use your cell phone or don't use your cell phone on the floor. If yeah. you're over there in the corner playing Candy Crush or over there, you know, doing X, Y, Z on Facebook on the clock when you're supposed uh -huh. to be doing something else, uh, mm -hmm. you know, don't be surprised when I don't take your advice uh, <laughs> very seriously on process improvement or a change, right? You've got mm -hmm. to act in a way that demands that respect and that recognition. Uh, so to close this out, you know, we got a couple of minutes here. I want to give you about a minute, Jake, to make your case and advocate, you know, for anyone today who's tuning in uh, on how they can make a, a real change, a real sustainable change in their department. Like, what do you want them to take away from this session thinking? I mean, do your due diligence, ask questions, question everything that you're doing and research the, the processes yourself get others involved next is, you know, say, hey, don't you think this process could be better? This is what I found. And find followers that will join you and, and spread the knowledge, spread the ideas. If maybe if somebody else wants to go looking at a different process, have them go after it and then meet together, share ideas, bring it to the manager if the manager doesn't listen, bring it somewhere else. Bring it to infection control, risk management, the surgical director, whoever will listen. Bring it to housekeeping. <laughs> whoever will listen. Love it. Um, Don't get shut them on up. your side. Yeah. yeah. Great. And then, Great. you no, know, just don't be, you know, looking down all the time. Say hello to your friends in the OR because, you know, you work with I, them every day, whether it's face to face or not. And that can change so much just being a positive face of your department. That's a great word. All right, Jameed, what do you think? I'm just going to piggyback on, on, on what Jake said. There's power in numbers. And when, when you go up and you, you have those interactions, like go to the OR huddle. Like if you guys aren't doing anything, if all you guys went to the OR huddle, it would be like, 
First, it's like, what are they doing here? Next thing you know, it's like, oh, they're part of our team. So that when you want to have those conversations, um, me sending a picture or writing a report because there was gross bio burden or sharps on a tray is not the same as Hank or Jake that they already know from coming to huddle, coming up to ask right. what's going on, going to the OR manager's office and say, gosh, we got to do something. This is our third needle this week. She's going to feel attached to that, and that's going to affect change. So there's powers in, power in numbers. Get your group together. Get that cool group together. Start holding your manager accountable. Start holding your fellow technicians accountable, and you can be that agent of change in your department. Awesome, guys. Uh, well, that's going to uh, close it down for this session. Adam, if you'll pop back in when you get a chance, uh, I'll hand it back to you, and I'll, I'll just close out by saying on our own side, uh, our philosophy at Beyond Clean is to fight dirty. One of our conference series in 2020 was fighting dirty together, and that's what this is really about. There is no such thing as doing a great job all by yourself in sterile processing. That's not possible. You have to do it together. And a lot of these things that frustrate you folks on the front line can be changed if you will partner together and collaborate together with your other technicians to be that that agent that agent of change that Jimmy mentioned earlier. So thank you for tuning in. And uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Adam. All right, great job, guys. I love everything you guys were saying about worker empowerment. That was amazing. Uh, Jimmy and Jake, great discussion, excellent takeaways. Um, I think the biggest thing I took from this is be that nerd, be that, that <laughs> geek that loves sterile processing so much that you just talk about it, you talk about improving processes all the time. I have seen department cultures change just from talking about that stuff uh, and being open about talking about it in the department. So thank you guys for everything. Uh, as our day comes to a close, we would like to say a special thank you to the Certification Board for Sterile Processing and Distribution, that's CBSPD, for encouraging continued education for sterile processing and teaming up with Beyond Clean to bring you their first ever con summer conference series. If you happen to miss part one of CBSPD's summer series, Flex, the Flexible Endoscope Conference, it is available to view anytime on demand, so just visit beyondclean.net slash virtual events to register, and you can view all those sessions at any time. I'd like to once again thank today's event sponsor, 3M. Without their support, this exciting day of virtual learning would not have been possible. And a special thank you to all our industry experts for joining us for this virtual event. I'd like to also recognize all of the professionals who reprocess surgical instruments across the globe. For all of you who chose to spend the day with us, educating yourself, we wanna thank you for your dedication to professional development and best practice. At the session's close, you will be directed to the conference survey page where you will have access to the survey. And from there, you can download your CE certificate. If you wanna come back to the survey later, you can visit the Beyond Clean Credit Hub anytime. All of today's sessions are available on demand. So watch, rewatch, share, and continue to access the downloadable resources provided for you. Stay safe out there, sterile processing. And as always, keep fighting dirty. We'll see you next time.